In machine learning, inference is the process of using live, unseen data with a machine learning model to make predictions. It basically means we're using the model in a production environment, or something like it, now that we're done with training. Before we deploy the model on our phone or microcontroller, let's examine it first. In your Edge Impulse project, go to the dashboard and download the neural network model. We'll want the int8 quantized version, as that is what Edge Impulse will build into a library for us head to netron.app. Netron is a web app that gives us a graphical view of our neural network. Note that Edge Impulse creates a TensorFlow Lite model for us, which is saved in the .tflite format. Here, you can see the layers that we have in our neural network. They should line up with the layers we used during the training step. Click on the input rectangle and you should see some information about the neural network as a whole. Here, you can see that it was created with TensorFlow Lite v3. If you were trying to use this model without the help of the Edge Impulse library, you would want to make sure that the version of TensorFlow Lite on your target system matched this version number. Next, let's take a look at the inputs. You can see that the model expects an array of 8-bit integers. Specifically, it's looking for a 1 by 33 element array, which should line up with the 33 features we are using. Normally, neural networks expect floating point values. However, one of the main features of TensorFlow Lite is its ability to quantize the inputs, outputs, and parameters. That means it converts all of these numbers from floating point values to integers, specifically 8-bit integers in this case. This quantization step saves a lot of memory in the processor or microcontroller, but it does result in a slight reduction in accuracy of the model. You can see the equation used to perform the quantization of the inputs here in Netron. Don't worry, the Edge Impulse library will take care of the quantization step for us, so we don't have to do it manually in code. You can also see what the model will output for us. It's another array of quantized numbers corresponding to the prediction probabilities for each class, which is why there are four numbers. Again, we would see the equation we would need to use to convert these 8-bit integers back into floating point values. The floating point outputs should be probabilities between 0 and 1. You can also click on each layer to get some more information about it. The numbers shown in between the layers are the outputs of that layer, which in our case should correspond to the number of nodes in the layer before it. We have 33 inputs going into a 20-node fully connected neural network layer, which feeds into a 10-node fully connected layer, and then into a 4-node fully connected layer. The softmax function is applied to these outputs to give us what is essentially the probabilities of each class that the neural network thinks the input features belong to. When we download the Edge Impulse library, it will contain not only our model, but the code necessary to perform feature extraction as well. The smartphone and Arduino libraries will come with examples to perform data collection in real time, but if we were doing this ourselves, we would need to collect two seconds of accelerometer data first before sending it to the Edge Impulse library. The Edge Impulse library expects 375 raw values for this particular project we're working on. With a 62.5 Hz sampling rate, we need to sample all three axes for two seconds to get that many values. The library will expect these values to be stored in an array, so if we're working in C++, we would just pass it a pointer to our buffer containing the raw accelerometer values. The library then performs the necessary feature extraction steps to calculate the 33 features we discussed in a previous lecture. These features are then passed to the model, which performs inference in order to predict which motion we're performing. The model will output four values, each corresponding to one of the four classes. Thanks to the softmax function built into the model, we would get the probabilities of each class. Let's use this as an example set of outputs from the model. All we would need to do at this point is figure out which of the outputs is the highest in order to determine the predicted class. Also note that all of the probabilities should sum up to one. In our demonstration for this motion project, this is exactly how we will perform live classification of motions. Our phone or microcontroller will sample for two seconds before sending the raw accelerometer data to the library for inference. The inference function will return the four predicted probabilities, which we can then use in our program. Instead of searching for the highest probability, we can also do a simple threshold comparison. This works very well if we're looking at a particular class. For example, we could have our code do something if the predicted probability of the 
left right class was above 0.5. Because the probabilities must add up to 1, we know that if one of them is more than 0.5, it must be the highest of the group. We can do the same with the other classes too. You can raise and lower the thresholds as you like. By raising the threshold, you're saying that you want to only count things that look closer to what the model is expecting for that class. With a lower threshold, you're allowing for motions that are good enough. In this demo, the whole process happens in three distinct steps. First, the accelerometer is sampled for two seconds. Next, features are extracted. Finally, inference is performed and you can take action based on that output. This process then loops indefinitely. Because feature extraction and inference can take a while to perform, upward of a few dozen to a few hundred milliseconds, you might miss motions. There are a few ways around that. You will want a way to sample the accelerometer at a regular interval while performing feature extraction and inference. This will allow you to classify the motions in real time. Some possible ways to do this are to set up a basic timer interrupt that fires every 16 milliseconds to sample the accelerometer. You could also configure a recurring task in a real-time operating system. Another possible method is to use direct memory access, or DMA, if your microcontroller supports it. Here, you would fill up a buffer of 2 seconds of accelerometer data in the background. Once once that happens, the buffer would be sent to the library for feature extraction and inference. While feature extraction and inference are being performed, your background task, interrupt routine or DMA, is collecting more data. You don't need another two seconds of data. In fact, you may want to overlap with some previous data. So you slide your window over by some amount and send that buffer to the library for inference. This process then repeats indefinitely, allowing you to have classification in real time. You must be very careful with the timing, however. If you take too long or use too many resources with inference, you could overflow the buffer or miss some samples. We'll see this in action later with the audio classification project.